There is a story I like about the origin of the game of chess, which is as follows. When the inventor of the game showed it to the emperor of India, the, the emperor was so impressed that he said to the man, name your reward and you shall have it. And the man was clever, so he, he responded, oh emperor, my wish is very simple. Please give me just one grain of rice for the first square of the chessboard, two grains for the next square, four for the next, and so on for all of the 64 squares. The emperor Agreed, of course, amazed at the humbleness of the inventor. But after a few days, the empire's treasurer came and said, Majesty, you are bankrupt. Not in a thousand lifetimes will your kingdom produce enough rice to satisfy the inventor's demand. One, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. The sequence of numbers follows what is called exponential growth. And its particularity is that, is that it reaches very fast astronomical proportions. To give you an idea, the amount of rice that the inventor was asking for is roughly equivalent to a million times the weight of the Taj Mahal in rice. And the reason why this tale is interesting to us today is that exponential growth also applies to information as we produce and collect information about the world and about ourselves, the amount of it also grows exponentially. I'm a data scientist. I have a passion for information, or specifically measured information, which is data. As a society, we have a tremendous need to comprehend vast amounts of information, because just as the stack of rice that keeps piling up on the chessboard the stack of our data keeps piling up in data warehouses. And that is because we capture everything, we measure everything. Some numbers. Every year, Google digitizes and stores more books than have been written in the first 5,000 years following the invention of writing. Every minute, people take and store more pictures than humanity did during the whole of the 19th century. And every second, measurements at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva generate as much data as all of these books and pictures combined. To give you an idea, this volume of data per second is equivalent to the simultaneous amount of human communication happening in the world. The constant data stream of the global conversation. And we capture everything and we measure everything. The numbers are mind-boggling. It's far too much to, to easily make sense of. So that's why people like me, data scientists, come into play. For data to paint a pattern, for data to, to tell a story, you need to feed it to computer programs called algorithms that help make decisions based on the data. So algorithms are a bit like cooking recipes for data because data on its own is meaningless, and algorithms on their own are quite dumb. But when coupled together, they become really powerful. They help inform our decisions. And that is the reason why we collect so much data. But now, here's the question that's been bugging me for a while now. Is this making our lives better? And the answer at first may seem easy. Yes, we use information to improve our lives. When I was 18 years old, I started writing a book on the future of humanity and, and the role of data and machines in it. And in my, in my mind, this future involved a gigantic computer called the supraconsciousness that, that could process every single data point on everyone and everything in the world and used advanced algorithms to solve global hunger, poverty, and war. And eventually, humanity as a data source would merge with a supraconsciousness and achieve immortality. I think this could have been a really good book. So it's, it's too bad I never got past chapter one. But is the vision really so far-fetched? Look at where we stand today. We use weather data from millions of sensors around the world, coupled with predictive algorithms, 
to predict and prevent against natural disasters. The cell phones in your pockets collect information on what you eat, how you sleep, how much you exercise to help you live a happy and healthy life. Your social network data, coupled with matching algorithms, can help you find a new job, a community of like-minded friends, or even love. Isn't that great? So let's just collect even more data and let algorithms decide on our lives. But hold on. There's also a dark side to data. Take, for example, the, mo the modern financial system. It uses something called black box trading, which is called like this because it is a system of algorithms interacting with one another in ways we can't predict and often don't understand. So in black box trading, there are stealth algorithms that break up big trade orders into many small ones so they can go undetected. And then there are anti-stealth algorithms, right? that try to detect the activity of the stealth algorithms so they can report on them to watchdog algorithms. And then there's spoofing algorithms that just pretend to be taking orders, but then don't, just to fool the other algorithms. And on top of that, there are trading algorithms, of course, that collect data on what's going on to try and make informed trading decisions. And all of these programs have been created by humans, Yet humans often can't control their behavior. And it sounds trivial until you realize that black box trading accounts for 90% of trade volume on the stock markets today. And it sounds funny until you remember the flash crash of May 2010, where black box algorithms were completely berserk, and 9% of the US stock market vanished in a few minutes more than a trillion dollars. People's retirement money, gone in smoke because of algorithms locked in a giant tug of war that has direct implications for our daily lives. And here we stand, watching the stock markets crash as the programs play hide and seek, and we don't understand why it happens. And I'm not very comfortable with this idea. And I suppose few of you are. This is not what I call information making the world better. In the 1960s, the economist and computer scientist Herbert Simon thought of the following problem. Imagine a small ant moving about the rugged landscape of Sandy Beach as it's traveling back home. The ant's destination is quite clear, yet its path is everything but a straight line because of the obstacles it encounters. And so Herbert Simon observes in what has come to be known as the parable of the ant. An ant, viewed as a behaving system, is quite simple. But the apparent complexity of its behavior is largely a reflection of the complexity of its environment. So Herbert Simon was formulating early ideas on decision-making in the presence of uncertainty for which he was later awarded the Nobel Prize. But here's what it means for us. In this parable, we are the ants, the simple ants, and the beach is our world of complex information. What we are trying to do by collecting more data is to reduce uncertainty, to see the obstacles in the sand, so we can build algorithms to plan the shortest route across the beach. And we call this data-driven decision-making. And we call this understanding the world. But sometimes, it just doesn't work. Sometimes, we control the algorithms, and sometimes, the algorithms control us. This is because, as we capture and measure information, thereby creating data, well, we become data, and data becomes us. And data has become my life and my everyday job. Yet, I still marvel when I see data, because I know data is people. And I think I just like people. <laughs> so I want to share something with you. I have recently decided to leave data on the side for a moment. In three months, 
I will be leaving Switzerland again and, and departing for India again. But this time, very slowly, never flying, walking a good part of the way. And over the course of the next four seasons, my fiancé, my dog, and I will travel in slow motion, work with rural communities, and teach children in Mongolia, in China, in Nepal, and India. But one of the reasons why I'm doing this is that one day I want to finish this book I started over 10 years ago. But I have realized that the book, to be complete, shouldn't be about the gigantic computer. It should be about the data, the lives of the people that it aims to improve. You know, algorithms do not describe true reality just the reality that we choose to describe. And reality is people and their lives. So I want to thank you in advance, you and everyone else, for helping me write the rest of the book. Thank you. <laughs>